Amen. You can turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 and mark your place, if you will. That's where we'll be today, but I want to begin. If you'll mark your place in 1 Peter and turn with me, first of all, to Matthew chapter 26. you really want to learn something, you need to go to someone who has experience in that particular field and learn from them. If you want to know something about mathematics and physics, you would begin with familiarizing yourself perhaps with the work of Isaac Newton. If you wanted to learn about investing, in our modern world today, you might look into the theory of investing practiced by Warren Buffett. But if you wanted to be more of a humble individual, if you wanted to seek humility, as we all should, then the person you need to talk to is Peter. No, I know you can't talk to him, but he can talk to us, and he has. And that is his topic this morning in 1 Peter 5, verses 5 to 7. But let me give you some background. Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. Just prior to the Lord's arrest and crucifixion, Matthew 26, 31, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you. I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Now, I know that was his intention, but it flowed from a heart of pride. Look over at verses 69 to 75, the same chapter. This is afterwards, after the arrest, I mean. During the trial of Jesus, verse 69, now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him saying, you also, were, were, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it. Before them all saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little while later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. He had that Galilean accent. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept. Bitterly. If you want, turn with me to the book of John now, the Gospel of John. We're going to fast forward just a little while, a few days. The Lord has been crucified. He's risen from the dead. Peter has assumed his uh, life of service for God was over. He went back to fishing. But the Lord came and met him on the shore there on the Sea of Galilee. Peter and the other disciples who had went with him had fished all night. 
caught no fish. We know the story. He told them to cast the net here. They caught a lot of fish. Uh, Peter jumps out of the boat, makes it to shore first, comes to the Lord. And after they had had some breakfast, verse 15 of John 21. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now that harkens back to when Peter said, if everybody else denies you, that's one thing, but I won't. Has Peter learned his lesson? Has he begun to deal with his pride? Do you love me more than these other men? Well, we know he goes on to ask him three times, do you love me? But I want you to drop down to verse 18. At the very end, Jesus says this, Most assuredly, I say to you, speaking of Peter, Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This John, in his inspired commentary, writes this. He spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. Now we know that indeed, although it's not recorded in Scripture, we know from history that Peter was crucified in Rome about the same time Paul was martyred at the hands of Nero, not too long after he wrote the book of 1 Peter. And he did stretch forth his hands. He was crucified like his Lord, but upside down. Because Peter requested it that way, saying that he was not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. Yes, Peter. He knew personally what we are warned of in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, where the scripture says, Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Peter, who was smitten with pride as a young man, even throughout his three years with the Lord as a disciple, learned humility. You might say he learned it the hard way. He learned it. He lived it. He wrote about it, and we're going to read it today and study it in First Peter. He learned it, lived it, wrote it, and he died it. Peter's a perfect one to teach us about humility. And so we turn to 1 Peter 5, verses 5 to 7. And we are reminded as we begin to talk about the pursuit of humility and the fact that it is a virtue that we all need and should pursue. We are reminded that when Peter wrote these words, in the culture of that day, humility was not valued was looked down upon. In fact, I would venture to say that it hasn't changed. We live today in a world where humility is not thought of as a great character trait, not in general. We should as God's people, but in the world today, no, it's not the humble people that are looked up to. It's the prideful ones, the boastful ones, the arrogant ones. But humility, as we're going to learn here, is something that we as Christians need to learn. We need to pursue it. Peter has much to say about it. He begins by answering for us four questions as to why humility is so important. When in verse 5 he says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Here he gives us reason number one why we should pursue virtue, pursue the virtue of humility. It is because humility facilitates submission. Now what do I mean by that? It is those who are humble that can truly be submissive. Those who are not humble do not submit to somebody else. Their pride will not let them take the lower position. And so when Peter says in verse 5, likewise, he hearkens back to some things he's already said in the book of 1 Peter. 
like in chapter 2, verse 13, when he said we should submit to those that have the authority over us in our government. Or like in chapter 2, verse 18, when he said that slaves ought to be submissive to their masters or employees to employers, if you will. Or in chapter 3, verse 1, when he says that wives should be submissive to their husbands. Or as he has just said in chapter 5 and verse 1, that we should be submissive to our elders in the church. So he has said much about this topic, and he is, he is finishing it up here in verse 5, and he says, likewise, and that harkens back to all those other things he's already said on the topic of submission. You younger ones, by the way, that's a, a male gender there, where he says younger ones or younger people uh, in the original. So he is really specifically addressing younger men who are just now attain, obtaining or attaining to status as husbands and head of households, and, and in, in Peter's day, uh, men of their own uh, uh, trade or profession, and, and of some standing now even in the church. But he says, you younger men need to learn to be submissive to your elders. Submit yourself to them. But then the rest of the verse says, yes, all of you. Now, in the second part of this compound uh, sentence, if you will, uh, he, he says one thing to everybody that is younger, and now he, he comes uh, to the second uh, part to speak to everybody, no matter who you are, and he says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Now, where it says be submissive to one another, you'll notice I've italicized it. It's not there in the original language. It's supplied by the translators because of the connection between what he says to begin with in that full sentence, likewise you younger people submit yourself to your elders, and what he says in the next sentence, yes, all of you be submissive. They are so closely connected, the translators understand that he still has submission in mind when he says literally in the last part of the verse, all of you be clothed with humility toward one another. So they insert submission because they realize there's this connection. Now you notice the you notice the word yes right here. It is a common Greek conjunction. And that's why in the New American Standard Bible you'll see it simply uh, translated and. It is a conjunction in the Greek which connects two coordinate ideas or thoughts. So he's talking about submission in both aspects of the sentence here. He specifically says, younger men, be submissive to your elders. But then he says, every one of you also need to be submissive, just like the younger men, so to speak, need to be submissive, uh, but to one another. And you do this by clothing yourself with humility. He is recognizing and pointing out the fact that submission is the result of humility. And we cannot fulfill all those obligations we have seen in 1 Peter and that Peter has talked about already. We can't fulfill those obligations unless we learn to be humble ourselves. Humility will facilitate that. Now, the second reason why we need to pursue humility as a virtue is because it is linked to service. It not only facilitates our ability to submit when we should. Uh, by, by the way, I, I, I should have mentioned that all of us need to be in submission to all the rest of us. That's what he just said, wasn't it? But not submission to authority there, but submission in the sense of placing yourself at their service. And so he continues now uh, on that vein, uh, and, and this is where we're at at point two, humility is linked to service. Well, how do we know that? Again, look at verse five. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to your elders. <clears throat> yes, all of you. Then the verb is in the original, be clothed. Be clothed with humility toward one another. 
Now, the, the term or the verb translated be clothed here in the New King James is a verb which means just simply to tie two things together. I, I think of it if you've got a bathrobe, uh, you know, you, you pull the bathrobe around you and you have that there kind of a sash or that belt uh, and you, you pull it around here and just, you know, tie it up like that. That's what he's talking about. And he's probably specifically here has in mind a, a robe that's somewhat similar to that or a tunic somewhat similar to that that was uh, an, referred to as a slave's apron. They had a lot of slaves in that day, obviously, uh, who wore particular garments. And, and Peter is saying all of us, in, in, in relation to everybody else in the body of Christ, needs to put on a slave's apron and assume the position or the function or the role of being a slave or a servant to everybody else. Peter had heard what Jesus said. He didn't get it at first as neither did any of the other disciples because you remember even right up to the, the Lord's Supper, right up to the, to the night before his crucifixion, the disciples were arguing, well, you know, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? And Jesus had to say to them on multiple occasions, the greatest among you will be the servant of all, the slave to others. And Peter is hearkening back, no doubt, to that, and not only to that, but to what happened in that upper room that night when they finally gathered for that last supper with the Lord Jesus Christ, when there was no slave at the door clothed in a slave's garment to wash the dirt and the, and the sand off of their feet, and not a single one of the twelve stooped to do the job, so Jesus lay aside his outer garment and got down on his hands and knees and he got, a he got into that basin of water and he began to wash the feet of his disciples. The Lord Jesus, God the Son, he was in no way inferior to them or, 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 or in no way to be submissive to them in regard to authority, but he submitted himself to their needs. He lowered himself to serve. And this is what Peter is talking about. Humility is required before people ever serve. Because when you serve someone else, you, you, by definition, you put yourself at a lower position. Humility. The word, by the way, in the original, means to have a sense of lowliness or littleness. But you know, it's just as wrong to think you are worthless as it is to think that you are something. You know, Satan likes to get us out of balance. It's amazing the number of people in this world who either really think that they are or something to behold or they want other people to think it. That's pride, and that's wrong. But sometimes we as Christian, we get defeated in our minds and discouraged, and, and we, we feel like we can't do anything or accomplish anything or be anything for the Lord, and, and we're just the lowest of the lowest of the low, and, and we're, we're, we're worthless, and we're, we're, we're just miserable, and, and, and that's just as wrong. So I suggest to you that humility is different than thinking yourself to be of no value. Humility is voluntarily submitting yourself to the needs of others, in spite of the fact that that's a lowly position. In fact, I like what Keith Brooks said, and I wish I'd have put this on screen, but if you're quick, you can write it down. Keith Brooks says, humility does not consist simply of thinking cheaply of oneself. He says humility is not thinking cheaply of oneself so much as it is not thinking of oneself at all. And of Christ more and more. Now that's really true humility. It, it's, not, it's not thinking where, do I, where am I at, it's more thinking not about yourself at all. Humility is being 
something totally different than being self-centered. Humility is, is, is totally removed from self-serving. Humility is about serving someone else. Not what's convenient for me, not, not what I want to do, not how I want to spend my time, not what I want to accomplish, not what I want to achieve, but what does somebody else need? That's humility. That's the attitude of humility he's talking about here when he says we ought to clothe ourselves with humility. Well, let's move on to reason number three we need to pursue humility. Number three, humility is the doorway to grace. Humility is the doorway to grace. Now, listen. We all understand, and we've talked many times about God's grace that comes to us that is unmerited, that we receive when we believe in Christ and accept Him as our Savior. By grace are we saved through faith and not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's the grace of salvation. But the grace that we receive in regard to our eternal standing at the moment we are saved means that we live in God's grace day to day as His children. Paul said, even though God wouldn't take away His thorn in the flesh, that what? God's grace was sufficient for Him. God's help, His grace, God's favor in life. And we could, we could really water, water it down to the concept of God's help or assistance or God's blessing, if you will. We need that every day. We partake of that every day. We just don't always realize it. Twice, literally twice this week, I was almost in a very serious auto accident. Once my wife was in the car and once... My daughter and my grandson were in the car. Two times in a week, in less than seven days. I, both times, it was a totally unexpected and unreasonable thing that happened. On one occasion, three, four lanes of traffic, a guy on my left just decided he wanted my space. And then last night, at the very last minute, someone just turned right in front of me. And I don't know, I don't know how, literally, we escaped an accident in both cases. But it was only by God's grace and help and oversight and protection that it occurred. We always are partaking of the grace of God as God's children. We just don't always recognize it. Now, with that thought in mind, let's look back at the Scripture. After saying that we need to be clothed with humility... Peter quotes, I won't say the word quotes, he refers to, because it's not a word-for-word word quote, but he alludes to Proverbs 3.34 when he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humility is the doorway to God's grace. It, 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 is, the, it is the guarantee, it is the assurance that we are walking and living each day in the grace of God. Because if pride versus humility is our guide, God's going to resist us. We are not going to be walking in the grace of God. We are literally going to be walking upstream, if you will. We're literally going to be moving against God. God is resisting us. Standing in our way because the only thing we're the only place we're going is uh, self-centered and self-serving. Luke refers also to Proverbs three thirty four in Luke eighteen verse fourteen after giving the parable of what the publican and the sinner, the tax collector that everybody hated, the worst of sinners, and the, the Pharisee. I should I say the publican? Uh, the publican was the tax collector. The Pharisee was the, was the guy who thought he was great. And the Pharisee, he comes and prays and says, well, thank you, God, I'm not like a sinner over here. I'm paraphrasing. You all know the story. But the, the tax collector beat on his breast and said, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. 
Oh, we don't like that word today, do we? I mean, in culturally, we don't like that word today. Uh, but it's still true. Sin is sin, and we're all sinners. And we need to be more like the hated tax collector, the publican, as he was called, the, the one who beat on his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and not at all like, not at all like the religious man, the Pharisee, who says, oh, Lord, I thank you, I'm not a bad person like him. And Luke refers, Proverbs 3.34, right after that. And then it's also in James chapter 4, verse 6. So there's four times, excuse me, four times in the Scripture, that's right, four times we see this in the Scripture. If you want God's help, God's assistance, God's blessing, if you want God's grace on a daily basis, humble yourself. Pride will put God in an adversarial position to you. There's reason number three. Now reason number four. Humility is an expression of faith. Three reasons so far. Humility facilitates submission. It's linked to service. It's a doorway to grace. But number four, reason number four why we need to pursue humility is that it is an expression of faith. Now, whereas points one, two, and three were pretty much argument, Point four is still giving us a fourth reason, but point four broadens the discussion. And point four is going to tell us how. It's going to tell us how. By the way, ignore those references on the, the verses up there. Those are all messed up, so <laughs> supply your own. Let's look at verses 6 and 7. He, gives, he begins by saying, therefore. Having said all that I've already said about why we need to pursue humility, he says, therefore, humble yourselves. <laughs> okay? I've given you three reasons, so do it. This is an imperative. It's a command. By the way, we saw the command earlier in verse 5 where he says, submit yourselves to your elders. We saw it earlier in verse 5 where he says, be clothed with humanity. Those are imperatives too. And so he just, he just gathers those other imperatives up and he puts them all together. And one final therefore, it says, do it. It's important. You have no option. This is what I require. And then he says this, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting your care upon him for he cares for you. Now, typically, verse 7, excuse me, typically, yeah, typically verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you, is quoted separately from verse 6. A lot of times uh, folks memorize 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares. Great verse to memorize. But it's only, it's only part of the picture here. Think for a minute. Why does, he, why does he talk about our fears, our anxieties, our worries, and how we need to cast them on the Lord uh, because he cares for us? Why would he bring that into the discussion at this moment? It seems like he's changed the subject. You can find commentaries that will say he's changed the subject here. He's not changed the subject. Here's how we know he hasn't changed the subject. Let's look at it. Here's verse 6 and 7. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, you see at the end of verse 6, at the end of the word time, what do you see there? A comma. It's not a period. So verse 6 and verse 7 go together as one sentence. It's not two different thoughts. Verse 7 is not something different and, and uh, it's not a change of subject, it's a continuation. After the comma, verse 7 begins, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The word casting is a participle. It's a verb that is used <clears throat> as if it were a modifier or an adjective or an adverb. It's the O-I-N-G words that we used to call them back in eighth grade. And a participle always modifies, 
it tells you something about a main verb. But what verb is this telling us something about? The main verb, humble yourselves. It's telling us something about the imperative we just talked about. When he says, therefore, humble yourselves. What is it telling us about humbling ourselves? I suggest to you, it is telling us how to humble ourselves. Or at least one aspect of how we can humble ourselves. It's giving us, if you will, the means to humility. Uh, I don't I don't don't see the connection okay look at it for a moment think about it if a person is not humble they are not dependent on God a prideful individual is focused on self he is self-centered he is self-serving he wants what he wants He is all about accomplishing his goals and his objectives. He's about taking what he can take for himself, achieving what he can achieve by his own strength and ability. That's pride. Humility realizes that when Jesus said, without me you can do nothing, that Jesus knew what he was talking about. God chooses to use us with the strength and the power to do anything worthwhile comes from the Holy Spirit that indwells us. So without Him, we can do nothing. Now, it's when we get so focused on our worries, so so locked in on our anxiety and our cares and what we want and what we think we need and, and what we fear we don't have or we might lose, It's when we get to that point that we are now tempted to take matters into our own hands and to become aggressive, to become arrogant, to become prideful, to become self-assertive, self-centered, and self-serving. But if instead we take those those anxieties, those fears, those worries, and we say, wait a minute, I can trust God. I don't have to worry. I don't have to be fearful. I can let God have him. I can put him on his back. Because I know that he loves me, and I know that he's going to take care of me. I'm free to serve others rather than to worry about self. Why is it that we cannot become servants like we should? It's because we can't get our hearts and minds off of self. And all that we are afraid of, all that we fear, all that we think we need, all that we think we deserve, what all, put those cares on the back of Jesus and you will enable yourself to serve in a way that you've never been able to serve before. Four reasons, then. And one big, how do we do it? (laughs) When you put it all together, you understand. You understand that humility is worth pursuing. Not only should we pursue it, not only do we have the reasons why, not only do we have some methodology as to how, but It's worth it. How do I know that? Well, again, look back, if you will, at verse 6. I tell you what, let's let's just back up to verse 5 again. The latter part of verse 5, and that that reference to Proverbs 3, verse 34. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Now, that's right here and now. That's today. That's not in the future. That's not eternal life. That's... Right here, where the rubber meets the road, you know, that's where we live. You're either going to be receiving the grace of God or God's going to be working against you. Now, assuming you're humbling yourself and pursuing humility, and and by the way, just as soon as we decide we've got humility, we probably lost it. (laughs) You ever had that? 
You ever had that happen to you? You do something, you think, then you step back and say, boy, that was really, I really did good there, didn't I? I really said, where did your humility go? So it's a hard thing to hold on to. That's why we're talking about pursuing it. Because we're always pursuing it. It's not like we're going to get it and keep it. It's going to slip through our fingers just as often as we are able to ha have, have a, a, a hold on it. But it's worth that battle. It's worth that effort. It's worth pursuing to have God's grace in the here and now. Not only that, verse 6 says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that, you, that He may exalt you in due time. Not only do we have His grace right now, not only do we partake of His help and assistance in the moment, but one day, <clears throat> eternally, if we have humbled ourselves, He's going to exalt us. <laughs> what does the Scripture say about helping Him rule and reign over the book of Revelation? That's just one aspect of it. So it's worth the effort. And it is an ongoing effort, but it's worth the effort. Pursue it.